Crank up the volume and get ready for real-world bird hunting by listening to the Wingman Podcast by Eastman's. Now your host, Todd Helms. Well, welcome everybody to episode 35 now, I think it is, of the Wingman Podcast. And this afternoon, I am lucky enough to have Mr. Dale Bordelon on from Bayou Beast Calls and kind of a renaissance man if you will dale it's been i really appreciate you taking some time and coming on to talk ducks with me well i appreciate it man that everything i do it revolves around ducks it looked like we just got back from spraying water lilies a while ago me and my hunting buddy and uh fixing a go in my shop do a few duck calls so is that time of the year to get all that stuff ready for the season yeah, it'll be here before we know it. It seems like, you know, I, when do your seasons down there open? You're in Louisiana, right? Yeah. Louisiana. And, uh, we, we're going to open around, uh, second week of November. Okay. Uh, somewhere in that ballpark. Sure. Sure. Oh, that's, that's great. That's yeah. We don't, we open earlier than that Dale, but I, we really don't see a lot of birds until, around Thanksgiving through Christmas and even into January, it seems like when the bulk of our birds out here show up too. So right. kind of on the same time frame. but we were at a couple of guys and I were actually talking today about getting, getting out and getting some blinds framed in and, uh, trimming some stuff up. Cause I like to leave them. I like to leave some of my permanent stuff out and let that vegetation grow up on them. So it looks as natural as possible, but or. Sure. I don't have to spray water lilies like you do. Oh my gosh. We losing eyes horrible, man. We got a bad infestation of floating mites, water lilies, salvina, everything. And man. uh I, I've been doing that for 30 years and uh or, or probably 35 years. And I want to make sure when I go duck hunting and we have a good season, I, I've been doing this a long time. I'll look around and see the, how does it look in my area. And I try to get everything water lizard, everything like it was that year, because that's something that attracted these ducks over here. Sure. And I don't want to kill everything. I just want to keep it, you know, you're going to have it wool and nasty ducks like that. I just want a good habitat where I can kill ducks. Yeah, no, and I, I bet there's a fine line, too, between having enough cover and too much. Very, very critical. I, I, I had a good friend of mine. He killed a lot of ducks one year in a new spot. He went there and cleaned. You heard, of course, you hear this all the time. He went there and cleaned it all up, put a brand new blind, and he hasn't killed a duck since then. He just quit hunting it. I learned that a long time ago. When you yeah. kill a duck, you better leave it. That's something that they like and leave it. Yeah. Alone. Yeah. No, I hear you. It's, it seems like out here, if we're hunting, of course, we hunt a lot of rivers um, out here. And that's, that's pretty much the only water we have for the birds in that time of year. And yeah, it's the same way. When you find where they're at, you don't disturb it much. You just go in, tuck yourself in. Maybe, maybe build a little blind or use a panel or something like that. But otherwise I don't disturb much. I like to leave it the way they're used to it. Absolutely. Yeah. So Dale, you, we, we were talking earlier, um, kind of trying to set up the podcast and get things straightened out. You and I had a pretty cool phone conversation and man, you've got a lot of history that goes into what you do and kind of your ethos of duck hunting and waterfowling and i'm looking at you you got a one of your calls hanging there around your <laughs> neck T let's start with that man tell me about these calls well the cane calls is what started louisiana the of duck calls and it's recorded it's been around since 1860 there's a, a there's a fella that i found out has a call and it has 1860 written on it but what happened, there's a bunch of guys from Illinois that came hunting in Louisiana in the 1850s, 1860s, around that, you know, late 1850s. They bought the calls to these French people in South Louisiana. Louisiana used to be the sh shang dang for ducks in those days. Everything came down. Sure. These, these Louisiana boys, uh, uh, Illinois boys came 
And these French people saw that. So they kind of took the idea and, and all that, that uh, cane was abundant over here in South Louisiana, river cane. That's the only species native to Louisiana. Okay. So, and it already had a hole in it. And you're talking about the 1800s. They didn't have no electricity. They didn't have no drill presses. They had a hole. So they, they took the idea around with it and started making cane coals. And they used reeds, I mean, uh, cane for reeds, and eventually old ace rubber comp. They used all kind of stuff, to, anything they can, because everybody was poor back then. And this went on all the way to the 1950s, I would say, 60s. And then all these big companies started coming in, and and now it's just a it, just a memory deal or a, a culture. Sure. My deal is, I really want to do like the old people did, hunt the old ways. So I, I've been making cane calls about thirty years, not to sell for my personal self. Okay. And I have a job, and that so many people wanted it. I found a fella that molded my cane calls out and I'll have a line of calls by you beast calls. It's a molded out cane call. And I'll, I'll sell those, but the people really wanted those cane calls. So I just took time and, and realized I'm just going to do this. It, it's in my heart. It's my culture. So I make uh, bamboo cane calls, just like you see right here with the old rap, like they did in the 18th night around 1900. <coughs> and, uh, it's part of my culture, and, and I really enjoy doing it, and I really want to save up culture if it's possible. And, and so that's why I'm doing it. And uh, I hunt with these, me and my boys, my best friend, they work really well, man. We kill ducks. I'm going to give you a sound fall if you don't believe me. Do it. Do it. <laughs> Got a good rasp, you can get high on it. I'll kill plenty of ducks with them little cane coals. They I love it. <laughs> I love it. That sounded so, great. I, so what, pretty, how do you put those together? I mean, I would imagine you're working with raw materials. Anytime you work with raw materials over something that's like synthetic, um, there's gotta be, there's gotta be some, some, well, there's some, there's an artistry to it. Well, what I do is, I'll go out and I'll find me a patch of bamboo. <clears throat> and look, I might have to travel three hours from home. I I've been all over Louisiana. And when I find me a good patch and I get the okay from a, the landowner, I usually give them a, nobody wants money. I'll make them a cane coal. Sure. Give me the, but I'll go with my boy. I cut my own cane. I come home and then I size it all up something i size it all up in a piece like like it's about three and a half inches sure i cut it i cut it longer than i need then when it's time so it's that's for drawing purposes it takes a month to draw if you do that if you don't cut it up you're looking at three four months okay i got a moisture meter and and everything outside is around 13 15 percent depending on the humidity here in louisiana so I, I put it in the house. I, I got a big tub with holes underneath on the sides where the air can get in. And I cut the big end, the little end, and I set it in the house. And it takes one month to draw. No humidity in the house with the air conditioner running. Sure. Dries fast, and it keeps it from molding. <laughs> you have a bad molding problem if there's a lot of humidity. So I put it in the house. I dry it good. I check it with my moisture meter. Then I'm ready to make coals. Then, it, then I take that like the big barrel, then I even it off, and that's why I size it down. It, it's about three, three and a quarter inches. I don't use the exact, I have one, every call is different. That's sure. how I made them 100 years ago. I'm trying to keep that part all by hand. And uh, I had, a, I had a, a, a very well known call maker came here a while back. I went to, well, let me back up. I went to Fox Game Calls, and the, the old man, Mr. Lejeune, he showed me how they make bamboo calls. Now, they have lates, big lates back from the 1950s. They cut the exhaust barrel, it's like a 20 degree angle, 
and they have a tapered rim on. They tapered the inside of that barrel where everything fits perfect. Okay, so this fella came, this call maker, and he told me the same thing like folks. He said, man, if you got, I was making a call with a pocket knife. He said, man, if you buy your late, man, you could save time and make all that fit. I said, yeah, I could, but it wouldn't be handmade. And that's the part I'm keeping. I'm going to do that till I die. I love so it. What I do is I get the big, I get a barrel, the little barrel, and I'm, I, I, it's like matching a puzzle. I'll just put it and see. And then so I'll get and I'll cut it. I made so many, I know about how much to cut. cut. Then I have a little jig in a vice with a double edge, file, a double uh, cutting file. And I file it down perfectly rounded. Everything's going to fit tight and perfect. That's how they did it 100, 130 years ago. And that's how I'm doing it. And it's, it, 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 it's very meaningful doing it. Now it's time consuming. It, I have about two hours in a call. So wow. I, that one weekend I did 20, 25 calls or three day weekend. I can't do that every day because I burn out. I set I myself a goal, three to five calls a day. And that way I can keep up and I don't get burned out. And, and, and I have, I had about 900 orders. That's about two years of back order of my book. So, and I tell these people, look, you get on my list in about two years. I can only do so much and what I can. And I appreciate all the bidders. It means a whole lot to me. And I enjoy it. It, it, And and I'm shipping these calls all over the United States, overseas, all over. Wow. I I feel good passing on a little Louisiana heritage around the United States. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. That is so cool. Yeah, you know, you and I had talked about that duck hunting is waterfowling it's it's more than just the birds you know there's there's so much tradition history culture it's more than just making piles it's more than just shooting limits you know there's man it's and so much of it is exactly what you were just talking about with building those calls you know you are capturing you are not even capturing you're pushing forward a piece of history that is not it's not dead. It's not going to die and it's still functional and it still works. And there's so much of that handmade artistry in that, that there's a value that goes beyond, you know, just like I said, shooting limits of ducks. There's well, something about that with waterfall. A lot of people, I'm not <laughs> knocking anyone. And I used to hunt like that. You go to a store, you buy your brand new camouflage going $1,500, your shell, your uh, shells. You go buy your boat and you go hunting. I did that for years. I'm not saying nothing about it. It's fine. Yep, I agree. But to me, it really picked it up a notch. I built my own dugout P roads like the old Frenchman. And I hunt out of these. That I, is cool. And I started that 20 years ago. I, I made four boats, four dugout P roads. Then I started uh, uh, with my cane calls. I'm, I carved my own decals. I have a 30 years of decals that I've been carving and, and all kinds of species. I've never bought a piece of wood to carve a decoy. I have pictures. I went in, when I'm hunting, I'm looking for that. And when I hunt at Calahoo Lake, that you find a lot of that sarpish so, root. I've, I've accumulated a lot of that stuff to carve my own ducks. And I said that years and years ago, if I'm gonna do this, it's going to be like my ancestors did. No stores involved, all hands on. Everything I hunt with now and it is made just like that. And uh, my old P Rogue, I got this last one I built. I, there's a fella got me a log, a logger. He called me. He logged a 600 acre track. And he said, Dale, I got a log. It's the biggest log on here. It's a big log, it doesn't have a branch. And it's long. I said, I'm coming this afternoon. Look at it. <laughs> I, I went over there. I, when I saw that log, I said, how long are you going to be here? He said, I, about a week. I said, I'll be back tomorrow. I had to get one of those big trailers. My trailer, my little 16-foot trailer is uh, 
four to five hundred pound axles wouldn't hold that. I went get a, a big heavy duty trailer. Me and a good friend, and he set that log on there. I bought it home. I counted the rings. That tree was started growing in 1844. I counted them twice. I wrote that on my payroll when I finished building it, 1844. And that tree, that boat, that tree was about five miles from where I duck hunt now. It's a big swamp, big sopper swamp right there. I would never cut a sopper tree down. These people, they had to cut it, it was in a contract. So by doing that, I'll, yeah, I'll take the log. Yeah. So, but I built me a dugout pier oak, it's a little over 14 foot long. Now, when the French, my people came here around in 1720 on both sides, my, my grandma, my grandpa, and on my mama's side, they come from France, they went to Canada. I'm all French all the way around. But when my ancestors came here in 1720, that the Indians was making dugout pier rogues, but they made a long boat, 30 feet long, and they burned the inside out. The French people, when they came here, they had blacksmiths. They were a little educated. So they had the tools. They just took that boat and shortened it up about 12 foot, dug it out with the foot adds, and uh, they got all kind of uh, bowl adds, Cooper's adds. They had, the, it, it, but you can't find that today. Blacksmiths made that in the old days. Sure. So that they started building dugouts <laughs> about 17 around 1780 the french wow and it went on till about 1930 now they logged all these big woods in louisiana from the 1850s to about 1930 and that's when the dugout make that's when the dugout period quit i mean they, there was no more big trees and uh, they started going to plank boats okay and they started okay. building plank boats in 18 uh 1930 all the way to in the 1980s, then fiberglass took over. And, and that's so, but anyway, my deal is to build a Piro like my ancestors did in the 1800s, along with my decors. And so I've accomplished that mission and, and I, I baptized it. I'm killing duck that I'm having a ball, man. When I sit in the, in the blind, I got handmade decors, cane calls, a dugout, my Piro, my, I, my own paddles. I've never bought a paddle in my life. I've been, make, been making paddles for 40 years. Every, and I shoot 0897. I was going to say. This is just stuff that, this is duck hunting to me. Yeah. Yes, sir. I don't have to kill anything. It's a, every time I go out, it's a, it's an outing to hunt like this. It's yeah. enjoyment. I'm keeping that heritage going, and, and, and that means a lot to me. And I, 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 I got two boys. They picking it up. They hunt like I hunt, not like me as bad, but I can see they're in that twenties. I'm sixty. I just made sixty, and uh, I'm having a ball, man. I, I don't know what you know. I'm enjoying duck hunting. Oh, good for you. <laughs> I that was one of the things when when you go on your Facebook page and Bayou Beast calls and and you look at your social media. It seems like you've always got that old 1897 Winchester in your hand and you're, oh, you know, you're wearing God. traditional clothes and, and you're the, I followed you when you were digging, when you were working on that dugout, I paid pretty close attention to you. That was before we started this podcast. And I thought to myself at the time watching you do that, I thought, man, what a labor of love that has got to be to be able to bite off a project that big. And I just watched you as you documented that process how does that, I mean, how does it, how's it paddle? How, how does it pull? I mean. Oh my gosh. That thing's like a, tire's like a jewel, man. I let, now when you build a dugout, the old master boat builders, they leave about three quarters of an inch on the sides and a, maybe if an inch, about an inch on the bottom, where they could pick it up with one hand and walk. Now I got a couple of boats it, it, it'll be hard for me to pick me and my boy can pick it up it's, and I've just about got it you know it but this like when I look at the old boats in the old days half of those boats are split for oh, yeah. the reason they go too thin okay but they, that's how they that was real boat craftsmanship and at, at, at that era 
my pirogue, I left some meat on it. Now, we can pick it up, but I got me a trailer I put it on. <laughs> the older I, I get, I ain't going to better be picking it up, you know, if I can hunt something. But anyway, that boat, is it's heaven. When the boats pass, it doesn't bounce. It busts at the waves, and it's like a, a locomotive. It takes you three or four strokes to get going, but when it gets going, you talk about powder like a jewel. I'll go powder all over the place in the summer. Just I love it so much. She really does well. Man, that is cool. That is cool. You know, you were talking about so much of what you're talking about doing is kind of it's it's in style right now especially uh in in the outdoor space you know uh the locavore movement knowing where your food comes from um growing your own food in gardens um to you know obviously hunting is waterfowling is it's a it's a pastime that we all love and enjoy but it puts food on the table too at the same time and oh, yeah. you're taking that to another level, man. It's like, you're, you're talking about when you're out hunting, you're looking around for in your environment for those resources that you can use for decoys. What are you looking for when you're out there looking for a decoy? Cause it can't just be any chunk of wood. I'm assuming. Well, over here in Louisiana, they use sawfish root and Tupelo gum, the trunk okay. of a Tupelo tree. Okay. I don't have Tupelo where I hunt, but I have plenty of sawfish. And uh, when I go to Calahula, there's not a lot of Tupelos. It's a lot of Sarpers. I've have found trees uprooted. I'm going to tell you a story. I was hunting one day at Calahula years ago, and I went, I found a, the, one of the biggest Sarpers roots I have ever seen in my life. I, I've never seen a root that big. It was way up on the bank. My boys was young, so I said, we're coming next week with my Piro. This was after duck season. I said, I'll... I was looking for decoys. Let me back up. I wasn't hunting. I was looking for decoy. But okay. I found this big root. In that time, it rained about 10 inches. And I went with my pirogue and my two bars. I put my two bars in my pirogue and I paddled down the barrier. Todd, I saw 10 snakes. Oh. One of my bars, when he saw one, he wanted to jump out the boat. My other boy, <laughs> he was not afraid of them. So I wouldn't say nothing. I would just slip by them, it was in the trees. When I got to the spot, this big root was up on the bank, but the water came up so much, it was right even with the boat. And I bought me a rope. So I got out on the bank and I tied that big root to the, uh, I tied it and I tied it to the back of my pea root and I put, I hauled it out behind my pea, I floored it out. I put my bars back and it was a long journey. I floated all the way back to the land. I bought my eight foot trailer. And then, so I backed it in the water oh, and I pulled it on there. I, I, I bet you I made 10 or 12 decoys. I, that was years ago now. Wow. But I go, we used to go in the spring pop. <laughs> Catahoula has a lot of history full of old decoys. Used to. I don't think you find too much no more. So I would go look for decoys, also look for soccer fruit, anything like that to make decoys. And, and I have a big stash in my shed right now uh, of soccer's root. I have about 30 handmade decoys to hunt with as we speak. And uh, never had a power tool on them. Never bought a piece of wood. Never used a power, all by hatchet and a draw knife. And I made my own draw knife to use. I, I, a lot of tools I've made. And uh, there again, it, it's really something to kill ducks on. I had a fella come film me a couple of years ago, the open day duck season. He wanted to, I said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring my duck out, all my decoys. Todd, I got 30 decoys. I got two big canvas bags, and I got a big floating speck I made. I put that about 70 yards. Confidence decoys. I will rig all that up, you know, and, and, and <clears throat> play with all that. The first day we hunted, we killed 24 ducks in one hour. Wow. With my homemade decoys <laughs> and my dugout pirogue so that, you know, do they work? Yes, they work. I paint them like the old people. It's not no professional paint. People think you got to have those old fancy decoys. I don't believe in all that. If When you're not killing ducks, they either seeing you, it's your blind concealment, or it's not the right wind where you're hunting. It's not your decoys because you can kill them over black jug when everything's perfect. Sure. Sure. 
yeah that the black jug thing i <clears throat> i grew up in the great lakes area in in michigan and there's a lot of diver hunters up there that hunted those big lakes and a lot of those guys would just use yeah bleach jugs they'd paint up bleach jugs and <clears throat> leave one half white one half and paint the other half black and rig out i don't know how many dozen of those things in lines and they killed piles of ducks over bleach jugs todd they got some feathers in catahoula they got two thousand per blind right not not now but in this era i mean sure all good. and they claim they kill as many big ducks as you yeah, have decoys i've never hunted with jugs but i know a lot of people that have sure and i see them all over catahoula and, and you know they're killing ducks so but uh, I don't think, I don't think like my my decals, they're not professionally painted. They paint like the old people. They are pretty. I like them. They'll kill ducks. I'm gonna tell you. Sure, sure. Well, take it. Let's take it back a step. You know, you talked about when a, a few minutes ago you were talking about. You know, you've been through the the modern the modern stuff. You know, when you bought the camo and you bought the you know the decoys and you did all this. And it, it sounds to me like you've come back to this. Why? You know, I mean, I, I know I, I get the connection, but what made you what made you want to do this? I'm going to tell you why. All my life, my daddy always took us in the woods hunting, camping. In the, every weekend, just about was in some Atlanta. But mo, in Atlanta, I was just when I'd see my daddy with sacks of ducks, it just blew my mind and and. I was a young man sitting at the camp and listening to the grown-ups talk. I was just watching when, when I, and to hear how these old people had hardships. They was the happiest people in the world. They sold ducks. Everybody was poor. My dad's good friend sold feathers. They put it in the, in the paper in the 1960s. And I remember that as a kid. I saved my feathers right now because of just that person, them people right there. It never left me. Yeah. But as I got older, the same people that would come to the camp, they got too old to hunt. So I, for 30 years, Todd, I've been bringing these people ducks and I'd go visit them. I would hear the stories from them 30 years to now. Now they all passed on. Sure. It's the stories they had. And it made me, that just set me back to, I want to be like them. I don't want to be like nobody now. They are my heroes. <laughs> so I stepped back and I want to be like the, everything was so simple back then. Model 12s, 1897s. That's the best guns they ever made. I had an old friend. Uh, can I tell you a story about an 18 about an old gun? I uh, please do. I had an old friend. He's dead now. He died at 90, 95 years old. They used to put it, they used to, when he was 12 years old, this was, I have a story written down, 1932. He went to the store with his daddy. He said, uh, Guy Prevo, that's the name of the fellow that had the store. And he said, Mr. Guy, my boy wants to buy a gun. You have something? And it had an 1897 on the rack. He said, I got this gun right here. And, and he said, how much you want for it? He said, that $26. Oh my gosh, we don't have that kind of money. This was 1932. He said, I tell you what you do. The, the, Sammy Poncher, he was 12 years old, the boy. He said, and Mr. Prevo said, Sammy, I'm going to give you that gun, but you're going to pay for it with ducks. Clean ducks. That man had a big glass case. You're looking in the 30s. He'd put a block ice in there and sell ducks to the public. That was legal back then. Sure. So this, this guy took that duck, and in that season, 12 years old, he paid for that gun. And when he would go back in the store, he see his own ducks in the glass case that man was selling. So I know telling how much that old man made off of him with that <laughs> with the duck, you know? No kidding. And, <laughs> so, but Mr. Simon used to put his ducks in the thirties with his daddy in the large well. Everybody had a well then because it stayed cool a few days longer till they got a good mess and they'd go sell them in New Orleans with a truckload. You know, they go with a whole bunch. I, Todd, I, I wrote a bunch of stories down because when I'd hear that, no, nobody cares. And the people die, the stores are dead. I have yes. a whole bunch of stores, and I was working on a book for this. I just got pressed for time with my duck calls and all, but I'm going to keep pursuing that. So, oh, man, please do. 
Todd, you there? Yep, I got you back. I don't know what my phone rang in the house. I don't know if that caused that or not. I who knows? It's okay. It's okay. You were talking about um taking ducks to New Orleans. Yeah, uh no, but that old man used to they used to put them in a well, in a live well. When they get a, a good load, they'd haul them to New Orleans and sell them. But those people drove me to do what I do now, these old people. That's why I hunt like I hunt because of these old people. Right. And I used to see these people all the time in town with old pierogues and, and ducks and everybody had burlap sacks. That's how they put their ducks in. And I sell burlap sacks with my name on it, you know, right now because of that. They look good. I put my ducks in burlap. I do everything like they've done. So <laughs> all that kind of is why I'm driven to what I'm doing now. And I love yeah. it. I love it. You said you were you were working on a book with all of these stories when we got cut off there. <laughs> I started a book, Todd. I got a bunch of stories. I mean a bunch. And I just stopped because of the call making. I have a job and I make calls. I just don't have time as we yeah. speak. I would, but I would one day I'm gonna pick it up and continue. I have a bunch of great stories, just like I told you, just awesome stories. People wouldn't believe the Hunting, killing all kind of ducks at, in the full moon, and uh, give me one, give me one, tell me one. One time, my friend, I had an old friend. This was 1950. They was killing a whole lot of ducks. It's a little lake over here by the house, and uh, there's a little town. The closest town is Hesma. That's where I was raised, Hesma, Louisiana. And he went. He would go hunting in the morning for this period of time and there was no ducks that was coming. Now, you know, the moon phase has different, sometimes the ducks do different things, but he could see all the feathers on the water. He said, something's wrong. He said, I'm coming tonight and I'm gonna be here. It was a full moon. I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna see what happens. So him and another friend went. They, went, they went at dark. He said, them ducks started showing up. They showed up for one hour with the moon. They shot duck for one hour and they killed 40 something. I have it written down. All mallards, that was in 1950. And he, this man was a very religious and he didn't tell no story. He said <laughs> it was 12, he said it was 12 o'clock at night. And he said, the reason I know, because the trains pass it every night through Hesmet at midnight and blows the horn. When we was killing duck, that train was blowing his horn at the same time. So that, it, it was, but that's a good story, shooting ducks with the, uh. Todd, I'm gonna tell you something. I wanna tell you another story. You know, people feed ducks. I have an old friend that sold duck for 40 years. I'm not gonna mention no names to a restaurant in New Orleans. He died at 101 years old. He fed, they fed ducks, wheat, corn, beans, marlow, everything you could think of. They did this. It, it, it was a market for them. He told me the best thing he ever used is chopped corn. Yeah. That's the best thing ducks like. Way better than whole corn. He said one opening day, they went a week before the season. It was about six inches of water. And they put chopped corn all over that ring. They went back when it opened for the opening day. A little, it was three of them. A little after nine o'clock, they had a little over 300 ducks. He said, as you'd shoot, that when a duck, this is how he explained to me, when a duck wants to feed, noise don't bother them. As they'd shoot, they would just keep landing. They, the noise didn't, they was making so much noise in that hole. They wanted them chopped corn so bad. They would just shoot, shoot, shoot. They killed a little over 300, and, and mo most of that was miles back then. They didn't shoot trash ducks. They didn't have a whole lot of trash ducks. Chopped corn. That man told me that story several times, and he passed. I would go visit him. I have a bunch of his stories, man. It, it's unbelievable. Wow. What what years were, I mean, obviously this was way back before, well, there wasn't uh, any laws on this. I'm going to tell you something, Todd. <laughs> the old people I know. The best duck hunt in Louisiana was in the 1960s and 70s. Okay. 
He, when he came back from the war in 1945, he couldn't kill a mallard duck over here in these swamps in Louisiana. For that in 1946, there was no mallards. <laughs> and and that, he, this man haunted, I mean haunted all the way to the end. They sold duck, they, they had a thing going on. They had a man come to his house from New Orleans to buy these ducks to serve in a, one of the biggest restaurants in New Orleans. He wouldn't, they would come get them for 40 years. Wow. What, what they would do, Todd, when the ducks would land, one day him and his boy killed 80 ducks in three bunches. Christmas day, Christmas Eve day from 10 o'clock till 12 over here. And this was the early 70s. Wow. When, they, when these ducks would land, they would, they would leave them sometimes five, 10 minutes. And then they would take that call and hit on the gun. When they when they when they got when a duck gets nervous, this is how he explains to them, and it's true. When a duck gets nervous, they bunch up before they take off. And then when they do that, he would take his call and hit on his he, he would knock on his gun. Then that way they all raise their head and they get all headshots. And they'd shoot three times. They they want a headshot, they were selling these ducks. Yeah. In the early 70s. <clears throat> So they would try to kill as much as they could, and they shot all low power. Don't let nobody fool you about a three nine. They didn't have three inch back then, hardly. Everything was with low power. They were shooting yeah. up close, killing all they can, you know. Shooting yeah, up. yeah. But uh, yeah, this this old man, he had some stories, man. And uh, his nephew is eighty five years old now, and he's still <laughs> hunting. Oh wow. I hope he, I could pull that off. Oh my gosh. I I don't know what I'd do if I'd sign a chip something right now to do that. <laughs> I, <laughs> I hear you. I'd give my bank account if I could do that. Right yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no kidding. No kidding. Oh my gosh. Yeah, the you gotta you gotta come up with that book. That would be uh man, that would I would buy it absolutely. Those are stories like that are priceless. You know, you like you were oh, talking once right. they're gone, they're gone. They're gone. That's right. Oh yeah. Uh, I mean, all kinds of stories. Uh, and I got several old people that gave me a lot of their stories and they all passed. I'm glad I got them. There's still some out there, but you got to get back. You got to get the old hunters that really, you know, really haunted and did a lot. Not just some fly by nights. Uh, these old people did that for a living. Right. They, man, it's unbelievable the stories they got. Uh, I, there's a man over here, a friend of mine. He's 74 years old. He, the most ducks he ever killed was 270 ducks in one hunt. Wow. Two, and most, that was 1973 and a hard, selling these ducks now. This was a hard freeze. These ducks was, they, they, man, they wanted. But Todd, my daddy had an old duck hole. They used to kill sacks of ducks back then too. I'm, I'm, I'm not that many like I just told you about, but they killed sacks. And and when I he would come home with that. My daddy was a khaki clothes man, a model 12 person, if you know what I'm talking about. I do. All, all business, no joke. I mean, he drank his beer. He was serious about hunting. He didn't, they didn't bring all this stuff with him. They just bought a sack. With a few and to bring the ducks back, old model twelve. He had a cartridge belt. They didn't shoot a whole lot of shells. They waited till they landed, and and they wouldn't shoot one here at sixty yards. There was no such thing as doing that back then that I remember growing up. And I grew up with these old people. There was good shots, but uh, these young people now, man, they waste them shell. And my boy is just as bad. I'm like, you know. <laughs> But hey, I do that too at times. Sometimes you got to do that to kill a duck. In this era, I mean, it's not yeah. like those days no more. Yeah, I, I can, I can agree with you on that one. There's days when, I mean, obviously, I, I talked about that. At, I did a YouTube video last year, and <clears throat> there was a morning in the blind that, um, man, the ducks were just finishing perfect. They were right in our faces, feet down. They were, it was perfect. But I talked about, you know, it's not always like that, you know. And if you're gonna, if you do want to kill birds. Sometimes you got to take them when they're, you know, at least here, you got to take them when they swing, you know, because if you let them swing again, they're probably not going to finish and you well, missed an, you missed an opportunity. And, but my goodness, what wouldn't we all like to just kill them right in our laps every day, you know? 
it, it makes it nice when it happens, but it don't happen a lot. My personal self, and I tell my boys that, and they hunt like that. When 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 they go when the ducks come, if they were the decoys the first pass, we shooting. Right. I don't wait for a duck to light unless I can see that he's coming down. I mean, right, right, right. If, if they fly and, and Todd, we kill a lot of ducks. We pretty good wing shots, and uh, I, I, my best friend, I've been hunting with him since we was twelve. He's I'm sick. To, he we sprayed waterless today. I'm a blessed man to still have a friend like that. Yeah. I know exactly what duck he's shooting and he knows what I'm shooting. And my boys picked that up. We hunt four in the blind. You shoot your end. I don't care what it is. Kill a whole lot more ducks on the wing. Don't yep. cross shoot this man's duck because he's close. That'll never happen in my blind. I'll chew him out. You shoot your ducks as they stay. Kill a lot of ducks doing that, Todd. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's something that I try to instill whenever I have new guys or people that are, that are new to duck hunting. That's something I try to talk to them about all the time. Like shoot as you are. And they're like, what does that mean? And I said, shoot the birds that are in front of you, not right. across. If you've got a turn to shoot a bird, it's probably in somebody else's spot and you shouldn't be shooting, you know, or, uh, and Dale, it's interesting here. A lot of the stuff we do because we hunt the rivers, we hunt are, are fast. And so with only a, with, with one dog or two, a lot of times, unless you know, you can kill a bird over land where he's not going to fall in the, in the water we limit it. We limit our shooting to, you know, one or two birds because any more than that, and we're losing them. They get down river in that fast current and, they get, and they're gone. Well, that's and, a good practice. Yeah. We, we just try to do that. So that does make it a little easier. We have a tendency, tendency to take turns that way. You know, it's sure. like, all right, I shot the last one. It's, it's so-and-so's turn this time. And then next up is this, you know, if we got a kid in the blind, they always get first crack, you exactly. know, no doubt and i i'll take my nephews and, and, and yeah you're right we put them in a hole we let them shoot but we're going to be shooting behind them now yeah. i mean if, 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 if it's yes, a slow day and, and, and you know it's not much they better hit they better shoot that first shot with <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah i love it i love but it i want to tell you though you're talking about these ducks we cook religiously over here at the camp and at home, all our ducks. It's a big thing to kill ducks and come home and my wife got like a, ten, a gumbo with 10 teals in it mm. or, 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 or I'll cook it. Or, and, and then we're eating, talking about the hunt. You're still hunting like that, you know? Yes. It, it just, there's no end to it. Yes. And so we just don't kill ducks. When I kill a duck, when we kill ducks, say we kill 18, 20 ducks or whatever. I have a big bucket at the camp. I'll start plucking the breast. We pluck our ducks behind. I'll start pluck, and then when I get three or four done, I throw them to my boys. We got one man gutting as three of us are plucking. I do. I'll go through all the ducks and get my feathers because I make pillars with them. Okay. So I take all the the good feathers, put them in a bucket, and then we continue. It doesn't take much time. Then. It goes to the gutter, then we gut them all, we hang them, let them dry. And then I just take my feathers when I get home and I dump them in a the sack and I put them in my shop. And I do that the next week. Wherever I go, I bring my bucket and I do that. I have five sacks of feathers right now. I just sprayed them this afternoon. I have an old French woman going to help me. I don't know how to sew. The more women know how to sew. <laughs> She's gonna, we're going we're gonna to make a pillow top and we're going to put it on YouTube made the old way like the old french people you know when you when you do that dale share that link with me i will put that up i will i would love to help you share that well, I that will. is cool we she got the old material i'm in an old french woman and i got the uh it's a feather stuffer people don't know too much about that in louisiana the old and them old women you know how you have a sausage stuffer mm -hmm. that used to have made out of sockets a feather stuffer i have one and it, they put them fast and they stuff it in there and, and, and then they, you know, sew it behind. She's going to do all that. We're going to record all that. Uh, now, that I, is cool. I, I think so. Uh, I'm anxious for that. Yeah. I am. I would love, I'm excited for that too. That'd be neat to see. You're talking about eating ducks. There's a, you know, there's tons of different ways to eat ducks, but you guys down there are really known for your food. And <laughs> how do you, what's your favorite way to eat ducks? 
Todd, I tell you what, we kill a good supply of ducks. I usually keep all my teals and wood ducks. I don't keep no other ducks. I'm not saying they're bad. Why keep a spoonbill and you got a bunch of teals? That's my point. And teals are very edible. What I like to do when I like to take a teal and I, I want I'll pot roast them whole. Just brown them real good. Put them in, you know, uh, I put onions, celery, bell peppers. I put, I like to put one turnip cubed up. It gives, it gives it an awesome flavor. Hmm. I put a little, I put about two tablespoons of fig preserve or strawberry. It gives it a good, good sweetness, man. And, but I put it, I put all that in there and I put it in the oven and uh, I, I put whiskers here. I put a little sausage. I cook it for on 350 a couple of hours. Maybe you can cook it three hours. It doesn't matter if it gets so tender once because you're not stirring it, you know? Yeah. And uh, I like to pot roast them like that. And and look, I take that cover off, they'll get brown, brown, just as per, just beautiful. Gumbo, I like to smoke some teals. Wood ducks, I cut them in half. They're a little bigger. I'll smoke them. Then I'll make a uh Make a roux, make a big gumbo, and just put them in there with all your stuff. I like that we put eggs in gumbo over here. Mm. That, that goes way back in my people. A lot of people don't eat that. We put eggs, sausage. We put all. Tom, we put air, you open the ice box and you do whatever you think you throw. <laughs> <in>. <laughs> That's <laughs> real gumbo right there. <laughs> that, that, that is a Louisiana tradition, right there. Open your ice box and just put what you got. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. So, yeah, I, I started a couple of years ago. I started plucking, uh, I mean, I've always plucked birds, um, but I got it, you know, I was a year in your twenties or, and you're get in the pile making mentality. And I, I think back to the number of birds that I just breasted out, you know, and, and cooked up different ways, uh, turned into sausage or jerky or whatever. And then I got eaten great, but I'm really uh, the last couple of years, I've really gotten into experimenting with, with stuff. And I've got two little girls and my wife likes, likes ducks. And the, I've, I've gotten, so I'll take that. I'll fillet that breast off. I'll pluck it and I'll fillet that off with the, with that skin on it, score that skin, you know, across like a hat cross hatch pattern and then fry it. Uh, surrender that fat, get it crispy and then throw it on a hot grill or flip it over and put it in a hot oven until it's like, I don't medium rare. And then, oh, and it's like the best ribeye steak you've ever had. You know, you throw some brown sugar, salt and pepper on it a little bit. My kids can't, they, they, they'll eat it as fast as I put it on their plate. I, I, I agree with you. Last year I was at the camp and, and my boy did some spoon bills. He debreast, he took them out, debreast them, cooked them just like you said. Now we didn't have all that stuff you talked about, but he cooked them. This, uh, from what I understand, Todd, medium rare is what you want. Right. He cooked them. He, he soaked them in something, and I don't know, not for long. He cooked it, and I said, that, that's just like a rib bar, man. It was a spoon bill. I, I said, know. Start debreasting some more duck. I've eaten it several <laughs> times, Todd. It's very good. It is. I really like it like that. Yeah. Yeah. And so what I do with the, with the rest of the bird then is I finish, I finish plucking it and my wife makes stock, you know, we'll, we'll boil it down with, with, uh, with the rest of the skin, the bones and the meat and just make, make stock and should make pies out of that. Um, and make soups with it, stews with it, you name it. Probably make gumbo that way too. I would, I would imagine. Oh, no, yeah. I don't see why not with that stock. That's what you know. We do that a lot. You boil it, and that juice, man, it just adds to the flavor yeah. so much. Yeah, yeah. I've got so I've started saving my hearts and livers too. Oh my gosh, that you talk about good. Yes, but sir. But that's so many ways. That's so many ways you can cook ducks, and 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 we just cook it all kind of ways. And, and my wife's cooking some. My wife is cooking some tonight, and I told her about the podcast. She said, "Well, we're gonna let me do it tomorrow." She'll be making all kind of noise, so she's gonna do it tomorrow. Todd talking about it. <laughs> oh, sitting here, sitting here talking about that. It's supper time here too. I'm getting hungry just talking about all this. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I love it, Dale, I, and I I love I love the that you've captured and and hung on to, gone back to 
that, you know, those old ways, that's an inspiration. You know, if, if you could, if you could grab a hold of this younger generation that's coming up in, in waterfowling and give them a word of advice, what would you tell them? I would tell to, to, to a younger person, go to your grand, go to your daddy's house, go to your grandpa's house. I'm sure most of them have guns. Get one of their old guns. Go get some ball shells. Use their old gun. If he's got an old ba bird bag, put that part into what you're doing and keep that heritage going. And that'll give you, the young guy, an incentive to hunt because he got part of his grandpa with him or his daddy. I tell a lot of people that. I, I did that by no choice. I didn't have no guns growing up. I still hunt with my daddy's old gun, or his old shell bag. All these old people, a lot of these old people, Todd gave me a lot of stuff after going to interview, visit him, and, and I'd bring up ducks. I use that, all that in my hunting. So I would tell a young guy, you don't need a $2,000 gun or the prettiest camouflage. A lot of, and that's not wrong with it. Sure. Get your daddy's old gun. Get your, get your boss shells, because they make shells to shoot any of those old guns. Sure. And go out and have fun with it. You, you don't have to kill 24 ducks, 18. It's an experience. Go enjoy the sunrise. Go enjoy it with a good friend, man. You can make, my, me and my friend made so many memories, Todd. We didn't kill nothing when we started. I, I had a 1956 Jeep and I was 14 years old and we drove the back roads. Our parents let us. We would walk at least a mile I would carry two sacks of decoy. He'd carry both guns. We would hunt. We wouldn't even kill nothing. But that was so many. We didn't know what we was doing. We learned on our own as a young man. We didn't. We we wouldn't kill nothing, but couldn't wait to go back the next day. We were so happy. <laughs> and then we started killing our daughters. Then you know they started helping us. But take all this stuff, take all that old stuff and just put it, your old peer, your grandpa's p rogue, man, just all this. That, that's what I would tell a young man. There's a connection, Todd. Everybody has a connection when it comes to waterfowl hunting. That's a personal connection. And, and that would keep you going. That would strive you to hunt more and enjoy the outing. You kill two or three, what's the difference? Just go have fun. Yeah, yeah. I think that is, I think that's sound wisdom, Dale. I, I really do. That's, I've got an old, my, one of my dad's, I've got several of my dad's old guns, but I've got a couple that I'll use occasionally. And man, on those hunts, if I kill one bird, day's made, you know, if I'm shooting that old over and under, I, my day's made because it's, it's like, I did it with dad's gun, you know, and I remember growing up watching him shoot ducks and geese with that gun Todd my grandpa died on my daddy saw it in 1965 he had a browning of one of those old brownings he he lost his arm in a cotton gin in 1925 <laughs> he raised eight kids you know didn't have welfare and all that right he had that old gun and my dad, my dad has passed on. He would, my dad would be 94 right now. He wow. died at 87. Okay. That, but my, my grandpa was so poor. The neighbor would come to him. He had money. My dad, my grandpa's name was We Day. That's Wilbert, French for Wilbert. Okay. He said, We Day, I'm going to give you 10 shells. That's paper shells. I want five Grobecks. That's a yellow crown night heron. They're oh, very, very edible. People ate these birds in a the depression. They, they're good eating, uh, Todd. He said, I'm gonna give you 10 shells. I want five growbacks. The shot you miss is yours. My grandpa was, they were starving. So he, he was killing for him too with those five shells here. Sure. But I took that old gun year before last, my brother, He's the oldest in the family, he, uh, the kid. He has his, it passed down to him. I took that old gun. I've never shot it in my life. I went with my son hunting over my handmade decoys I carved, and I killed the first duck with I killed one duck, Todd. 
took a picture. My boy killed two or three. I killed one. That's all I wanted to do. Yeah. My boy shot the rest. I took a picture. I hung him in a tree with my grandpa's old gun. Money, money cannot buy that, what I just told you. I went yeah. back to the cap. I gave the gun back to my brother. So you can take it home. I accomplished the mission. <laughs> the next day, I used my daughter's Model 12. Killed ducks with it. My, my dad left it for me. It's an old Model 12. That means so much to me what I just told you. That's what, it, that's what it's about. The memories yeah. you make in duck hunting, the heritage is a big part, man. And, and, and using your grand, your dad is your, your ancestor stuff. It's a connection. Everything has a connection when it comes to duck hunting. Yeah. No, and I think about the people that are just picking it up, <clears throat> you know, and they may not have that connection to some of that old stuff but they can build their own, you know, oh. they can build that heritage from, from ground, ground zero. So three generations from now, their grandkids are going, man, this was grandpa's, you know, this was grandpa's, uh, you know, CZ 10, 12, you know, or this was grandpa's whatever. And this is grandpa's jacket, you know, this, this, I don't know, this Sitka jacket he had or whatever it might be. That's right. You know, it, those things, if you take care of that stuff, it still lasts, you know, that stuff doesn't go bad. So I think about that to, to people who are listening and they're going, well, yeah, but I don't, I, I just started this. I don't know anybody. That's okay. Your generation one, you're the start of this for your family. And you don't have to hunt for a hundred years with something. Pick your, pick your gun up, go buy your gun. If you don't have done. Right. The little memories you make with that, you pass that on to your kids. And next year, your kids or whoever, you know, this was my daddy's. Everybody's proud to have something from that daddy or that grandpa. So it's not too late to say, I'm too late. I don't have nothing to go to buy your nice gun and, and, and just use that, pass it down to your kids. It would it, mean a lot to them. No, I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. You know, I'd, I, I wonder about that. You know, sometimes I see what you do and I see how I grew up and I remember, I have very fond memories. We used to do a goose camp in the upper peninsula of Michigan. And I remember that old generation come back from world war II, and they're all gone. Now they've been gone for years, but I had the man, I had the distinct pleasure. I will never forget calling in. We called him, uh, grandpa Charlie and grandpa Charlie was a character and he shot an old three inch model 12 wore a, ll bean canvas jacket you know and and had all that old stuff and couldn't stand up to shoot anymore i think he was in his like he was 91 the last year and i was i was a kid dale i think i was like 15 16 years old and i called in a goose a, a single goose over the decoys and he sat up and he shot that well he didn't sit up he was already sitting but he leaned forward and he shot that bird and that was the last time he went to goose camp. And that was the last goose he ever killed. And I got to do, got to call that bird in for him. That memory is etched into my brain, you know, and I, I cherish that. I cherish that. And Todd, on a, if you like me on a bad day or, or just any good, any given day, that's a little flashback ball. Just pick you up another sprint and keep you going. <laughs> yes, sir. It just did. I had, um, uh, Actually, today was kind of a tough one. <laughs> you know, every work isn't always fun. You know what I mean? Oh, and and yeah. uh, sitting down with you and having a good conversation about these stories, I'm smiling and I'm laughing. And man, this was I needed this conversation. And I I appreciate it. I'm uh, we're we're getting pressed for time on this thing, and I think we've got another couple hours in us at least. I would love to sit back down with you sometime and maybe after season and talk about some of the stuff that you've got in the works. And yeah, I, I want to know more about this, about this pillow you're making. I'm going to give you how many ducks, how much it weighs. I have all that log right now. I love I'll, it. I keep a record and all of that. Oh man. I love some, it. Some good information. Well, Dale, thank you so much. And I'll let you go and get to dinner and, uh, so your wife isn't harping on you from the other room. <laughs> oh, she ain't not worried about that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but I appreciate, appreciate it, dog. I really appreciate your time. And 
we'll have to sit back down again and, and uh, rehash some more stuff. Cause like I said, you, you are a fountain of information and old good stories. And I, I appreciate what you're doing down there, hanging on to the old ways, man. That's really cool. Well, I thank you. And, and I plan to go out hunting like I'm hunting right now. And I, I, I enjoy it. So, but I want to thank you for letting me tell my story and get it out all over. It means a lot to him. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I thank you for being on. It's one of those things that I, like I said, I've been an admirer of what you do for a couple of years now and on social media. And I thought when we started this podcast, I thought, man, he'd be an interesting guest. And then lo and behold, I had Ramsey Russell on a few weeks back and he, you came very highly recommended from Ramsey Russell. I was like, okay, I'm calling him. <laughs> Ramsey comes down to Louisiana every now and then, and I go with him on these podcasts. And then, and, you know, I'll find people for him, or, or he calls me, and then he knows somebody. And, but we all at Ramsey's a fine fella. Yeah. And we're going to go here in September, make a little run down south. And uh, I always love spending time with him. He's down, a genuine down to earth, very fine fella. And, and, and uh, he's a good friend of mine. That's cool. Well, I got one more question for you, Dale, and I'll let you go. And I've been trying to close out my podcast episodes asking this one. If you could only hunt one duck one way for the rest of your life, what's it going to be? Probably blue wing teals out of my dugout, my uh, Piro blind. Love it. But I started hunting that when I was young. I got so many memories of blue wing teal season from the 70s. And just to watch that blue patch bank and that song, yeah. that there's nothing prettier than that. I, I choose that over mileage. Now people think I'm stupid. Mileage fun. They're overrated to me. I love to shoot blue wings. Sure, sure. I love the hot, the heat. It's not cold. You got your little fronts coming through. LA shoot the foot college football games are kicking off, and it's a it's the first thing you're hunting. The first time you go. It's just the kick off. It. It's just an awesome, awesome feeling I get hunting those blue wings. I love it. I love it. Yeah, we don't get much of that up here. They're pretty much gone by the time our seasons are open, but I wish we did. I got to do a little bit here and there, but well, Dale, thank you again, man. I appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to sitting down and visiting some more in the future. Thank you, Todd. Y'all have a good one. Yes, sir. You too.